Hello and welcome to the latest World Horse Welfare Wednesday webinar. For those of you joining us before, you're joining us, you'll know because you are joining us by Zoom. We're just going to mark time slightly whilst we wait for those to join us on Facebook Live. And then we're going to get going on what I know is going to be a really fascinating webinar to finish off our winter webinar series. So a very warm welcome to everyone who's joining us on Facebook Live for tonight's or today's webinar, uh, World Horse Welfare Wednesday webinar. And um, we're delighted to w welcome Karen Coombs from Bell Equine and World Horse Welfare Field Officer Chris Shaw. For, if you joined us before, you'll know the format that we have a, a, a session where this evening format is where Karen's going to present to us for about half an hour. We've then got a structured Q&A um, with um, Chris and Karen, and then the floor is very much yours. So we very much want an interaction here. Uh, so if you're joining us on Facebook Live, please put your questions in the comment section and we'll transfer them across. And if you're joining us on Zoom, then you'll be able to please use the Q&A function. By all means, use the uh, uh, chat function to chat amongst yourselves. But if you can put the Q&A, uh, your questions in the Q&A function, it's so much easier for me to get through those. And if there's a question you like there, you can also upvote them on Zoom. Now, we've obviously been running our webinars for several years now, since 2020, um, and all of them are available on our YouTube channel. So tonight's uh, or today's webinar and all the ones we've done previously are there. So please do tell your friends and family. Now, today is the last of our winter webinar series. We are going to be having a sort of a one-off extra webinar on Wednesday, the 3rd of May. That's going to be during Strang Strangles Awareness Week, and we will put up a, a link Link to be able to register for the Strangles Awareness Week uh, webinar then. And then we'll be looking to restart them again in the winter. Obviously, that's a Northern Hemisphere winter uh, when the nights start closing in. So the World Horse Welfare winter webinars uh, will start again in, in late October. So if you've got any ideas that you would like us to include in those webinars in terms of topics to cover, then please do um, email us on education at worldhorsewelfare.org. So to tonight, really glad to welcome Karen, Karen Coombs and, and Chris Shaw on po poisonous plants. And what we want to try and focus on tonight is, you know, the common poisonous plants that we will come in contact with, um, possibly come in contact with as horse owners, but also possibly some of the stranger ones too. So and, and sort of, as ever, a, a practical sort of overlook of what we can do to minimise the risk and protect our horses most effectively. So before I introduce you to our uh, speakers and panellists, I'm going to set you a small task. Um, so let, let me just, um, I need just to, to share my screen, which you would have thought I could do much more effectively than I'm doing at the moment. But here we go. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and we're going to go to the from the beginning. So hopefully you can see that, um, the poisonous plants. And um, the question to you is, what poisonous plant is this? So I hope you'll be able to see that. Um, um, and the, the three choices you've got there are, what poisonous plant is ragwort, buttercups, or St. John's wort? So um, what poisonous plant is that? Um, is it St. John's wort, ragwort, or buttercup. So whilst you're answering that question, I'm going to introduce you um, to our main presenter, which is Karen Coombs. Now, I just want to check, can we? Can you see the bio? Um, Karen, can you see your bio there? Yes, you can. Brilliant. So delighted to welcome Karen who is um, from for many years been at Bell Equine down in Kent and has been a great friend of World Horse Welfare over the years. And she is a consummate professional, as you'll see from, from the slide here. She's been involved in so much both in equine practice, but also with Horse and Hound. And many of you all have read her veterinary column in Horse and Hound over the years. And she's been extremely involved in horse sport and has been to countless last four Olympic Games. And maybe she'll tell us shortly whether she's going to Paris. Now, as you know, we always like telling you a quirky fact about all our presenters. And um, K Karen's one is that she was once a member of a team anaesthetizing a giant panda at London Zoo. And a picture is there on the slide. Now, the question, of course, is 
what were they doing to the panda? And, and I know that Karen will tell us about that in a moment. But before I hand over to Karen, let's see how we got on with the quiz um, and or the poll. And look at that. 41% um, of you said Radwort, 14% of you said Buttercups, and 45% of you said St John's Wort. Um, now, um, Karen, I'm going to hand over to you and you can give us the answer to the question. I'll unmute myself, hopefully. <laughs> and it is actually St John's Wort, which proving the rule that all the other answers are pretty close because most yellow plants aren't very pleasant for horses there you go well so well what a, a good highlight or a headline why tonight's um or today's webinar is so important so karen i'm gonna hand the floor to you okay i'll try screen sharing now brilliant hang on whoops so I'm now screen sharing and just need to put is, it is it the right shape for you guys now? Is that what you need to see? That is what we need to see. That's looking good. Now we can see all of that. So over to you. Lovely. Well, Roly, thank you for that introduction. Pandas will have to wait for a bit because I've got a lot to say. Uh, but I thought I'd start with this introductory slide because... This is a picture of the clinic where I work, taken very early one morning. And I was frightfully proud of the jolly picture of Kent. You can see oast houses in the background, my own horse, until I reviewed this picture closely. And the observant ones of you can see a single strand of ragwort. I don't know if the arrow pointer shows up with you, but jolly embarrassing to discover yeah, that yes. we had ragwort in our own posh paddock. I went straight out and bought a ragwort router, de-router device after that. It just to prove it gets everywhere. Very embarrassing. Don't tell everyone. So uh, what I wanted to go through is the sort of poisonings that we see in practice with horses. And this is a picture of the book that we all got given in our final year as vet students, a rather embarrassingly long time ago. Uh, and in actual fact, when I flick through that, I still use it and it hasn't changed that much, which is somewhat shocking, I guess. But to go through what affects horses, these are the main ones I want to talk about tonight because they're the ones we all know and recognise most commonly, particularly ragwort. I would say that's our number one. Sycamores have are the close front runner and are taking over in a number of cases we see because people are so vigilant with ragwort these days due to publicity from people like World Horse Welfare. Oaks and acorn toxicity is still a real issue. Also buttercups and nettles, not quite so nasty, but they're a problem. Now, other things, there are many other poisonous plants out there, but the key ones to think about are particularly yew and water hemlock, which I'll cover as they are particularly nasty. And then things like bracken, we used to see a lot of when bracken was used as a bedding, less so now. Foxgloves can be impressively poisonous, as can laurel, hedge cuttings, rhododendron, which I can't even pronounce, laburnum, as well as many others. But what I wanted to emphasize uh, that when you get that quiz question, what is the most poisonous plant in the world? The answer's got to be tobacco. It might be more so for people than horses, but I have encountered several cases of tobacco poisoning, uh, nicotine toxicity in horses. And I put in capitals in the end. Uh, now I set my time watch and didn't let it start, but now it is, is lush grass is has to be considered almost poisonous in its own awful way when I get laminitis and overweight horses. So, uh, this is the picture that greeted me. I went to stay in a holiday cottage, arrived in the dark, opened the core curtains in the morning, and this was the view out my little bedroom window in this cute old cottage. I did rather feel that work was following me around. I mean, this is just so hideous. There is, this is ragwort, your proper yellow flower, uh, and it is everywhere. The poor horse is thin. It's a, entire, it's not been gelded and there's droppings everywhere. So 
yet this horse is quietly grazing as much as he can. And I have to say, seeing that every morning when I was on holiday there was heartbreaking and we did do what we could about it. But so uh, this is another case. This is a horse which has got ragwort toxicity. It is thin. It's tucked up. It's got photosensitization where the white parts of the skin are damaged and are peeling off because the liver is no longer working properly. Toxins accumulate in the skin. And as a result, this white pale skin gets sunburnt and it is particularly unpleasant for the poor horse. So ragwort is best avoided. This particular case was confirmed by liver biopsy. Now, I've given you a summary word slide because I know these get displayed later, uh, just to remind everyone that ragwort is the hit and run toxin in that the tox uh, poison accumulates and the damage is once it's there, it's irreversible. It causes serious damage to horses' livers. Most horses won't actually eat it, unless like my poor horse in the first picture, it's they've got nothing else to eat. It's pretty unpalatable, I'm told, not that I've tried it. And, but in hay, it will, when it's wilted or if it's been pulled up, it is more palatable and more likely to get eaten. So the take home message there is never pull out plants and leave them where the horses can reach them as that's when they will be eaten. And obviously the more they eat, the worse the damage is. So as I've already said, Horses will really only eat ragwort if there is nothing else available. And the extraordinary thing is, and this is why I call it a hit and run poison, is they'll eat the ragwort, it'll affect the liver, but the liver is extremely good at coping with a certain level of damage. So many horses with mild ragwort toxicity appear healthy, and then they deteriorate dramatically if there's any further liver damage. The liver damage causes weight loss, as well as loss of appetite and other vague signs. And in some severe cases, this liver damage can be fatal. I would reiterate that we see less ragwort cases now that's still out there, but I think people are much more vigilant and everyone is more aware. So moving on, um, atypical myoglobinuria or sycamore poisoning is almost taken over with the clinical caseload we see of horses with plant poisoning. Uh, that has certainly increased. I suspect it was always there, but it's only in the last 10 years or so that it's come to prominence when people have actually identified that it is the toxin which is found in the sycamore seeds particularly in these seedlings here and is responsible for most of the cases that we see in the UK and it's actually most of these maple type trees which aces which can cause it. We see it particularly common in autumn frequently after wet and windy weather storms when the seedlings get blown down. The name it's also called atypical, i.e. it's not typical, myoglobinuria, which means there's breakdown products of muscle damage in the urine. So myoglobin, muscle damage, ure, urea, urine. The poison itself is present in the seedlings here, the little helicopters we all know, and in the seedlings. And again, with ragwort, the cases are most commonly seen is horse on, in horses kept on sparse grazing. Now, the clinical signs of this condition, as I said, atypical myopathy or myoglobinuria, a weakness, muscle tremors, dark urine and collapse. And sadly, it is also often fatal. So if you see your horses lying down, this could be a cause. This is actually our own two horses, the same gray horse in the paddock I showed you at the start, just blissfully dozing in the sunshine, but it highlights the need for regular observation. Now, if you've got this nasty condition, you will get myoglobin, a 
released from the damaged muscles, this results in a browned color in the horse's urine. So if you're worried that you've got a horse that looks a bit weak, a bit wobbly, a bit shaky, try and catch a urine sample, not in a little test tube like this, but you know, in a bucket. And you need to be aware, normal horse urine looks like cider or white wine, as we all know. Uh, once there's a problem like this, you will have urine which looks like red wine or port or Ribena, but always be aware that urine does tend to go a bit pink when it mixes with fresh shavings. So don't panic on that point. We as vets will diagnose it from the signs, which unfortunately are pretty obvious. And we can do blood tests to measure the level of muscle damage. The sooner cases are seen, the sooner treatment can be started, the higher the chance of recovery. It is jolly costly to treat because Horses will need large amounts of intravenous fluid to wash away the toxins and flush their kidneys and keep their kidneys working in a number of for a number of days, in addition to other therapies and intensive care. I do have a particularly gory slide I decided not to include, where we had a row of horses recumbent in our anesthesia mox, all on drips. And this would have been 20, 30 years ago when the case the condition was just being recognized. Uh, this is just to show one of the local horses. And there's trees all over. Any sycamore within 500 meters is a potential risk, but the trees don't always produce the toxin. It varies from year to year and from tree to tree. And research has shown that horses will vary in their individual response to the toxin. You know, we don't know. Do some horses eat more of the toxin or are some others just others some tougher than others but i there will be a link coming up telling you that you can actually get the trees samples from the trees checked to see if your trees produce the toxin but there are things you can do to reduce the risk some are obvious and i appreciate it's easy for me to sit here and say it but it might not be as easy for you to avoid grazing your horses on fields containing sycamore trees where possible. And if you can't avoid it, it helps to give them supplementary hay and avoid overgrazing on the pasture. Reducing turnout during the at-risk months, which is winter, October to December, or where there are regional outbreaks should also be considered. Young horses appear to be at an increased risk and I would strongly advocate testing the trees rather than chopping them down. Uh, oh yes, I put this picture in. This was when I was trekking in the Middle East exactly a year ago today. It's one of those pictures that popped up on your phone as a year ago pictures. And this just shows you when the grazing is sparse, the risk of eating something poisonous is going to be higher. Now, the next tree, uh, and I really, really don't want to advocate getting rid of trees, as I'll highlight, is acorn poisoning. And if those of you have got a scientific bent, we published an article on this in uh, Bell Equin, where I work a few years ago, uh, when we had a whole, we had nine cases in one particular season. And this is a weird thing with acorn poisonings, that some years are much, much worse than others. Uh, sometimes the trees will produce vast amounts of acorns and sometimes the acorns have more of the tox and toxic product, which are tannins in them. Here, I think we've got, yeah. So the tree is poisonous, but it's mostly the acorns that they eat. The risk is highest at the end if we've got a long dry summer or the wind blows a lot of acorns down at once. And it's really, again, weird because some horses will suffer, others won't. and get the impression that most horses actually aren't going to eat a lot of acorns but some of them will get a taste for it and definitely want to be on pasture away from it and it's a tannic acid which is toxic when they consume enough of them the poisons cause damage to the guts affects get diarrhea colic damage the kidneys and it can be fatal unfortunately again prevention is easier said than done you want to avoid access to large number of acorns especially after windstorms you can if, if you've got 
possibly sweep up the acorns, electric fence it used to keep the horses away, or I've seen people using rollers to push the acorns into the ground, which seems to be pretty effective. Other options, again, particularly in the new forest where they've got a lot of acorns, uh, they allow pigs to graze because they happily hoover up the acorns with no bad effects. And it's got the added advantage of training your horse to accept pigs. Uh, this is just to remind me to lovely picture horse with diarrhea, which is something we do see with acorn toxicity. And it is pretty easy to diagnose because you will see bits of chewed acorns in this diarrhea. Lovely. Uh, so it is pretty obvious. Uh, that was just one of my favorite tree pictures to say please, please don't consider cutting the trees, all the trees down just as because a few may be poisonous. We need our trees and think of the shade they provide in the summer. So moving on, how are we doing for time? I need to keep cantering on. Uh, all right. So as a general rule, yellow flowers are not wanted on pasture. This is a picture of a sort of overflush of buttercups. Buttercups contain, now I have to pronounce this carefully, tranulculin. I actually looked up how to pronounce it on Google, which is a toxic blistering agent, which is also pronounced protoanemonin, according to the American Google I listened to, when the plant is crushed or chewed. And the bitter tasting oil irritates the gums in the horse's mouth and digestive tract. It's so bitter that horses are unlikely to eat a lot of it. But you might notice if your horse is exposed to buttercups that they get skin sores, blisters, swollen faces. And if they really get not a lot else to eat, they'll start dribbling a lot or salivating more than they should. The toxicity varies depending on the plant age, the growing conditions and freshness of foliage. Uh, plants are most dangerous when they're in the early stages, just as they're coming into bud and they've got young flowers. And the encouraging thing to know, because you often see buttercups in hay, is that the dried buttercup foliage is not harmful because the toxic oil evaporates quickly after the plants are cut. So it's the opposite to ragwort. So they're more toxic in the hay, buttercups not so. Uh, I just stuck this in picture as a horse I saw last summer with buttercup toxicity. Uh, and this is what we usually see. It's a contact dermatitis. So the horse hasn't actually eaten the plant. So, but the irritated oil with the dew in the morning has rubbed on its nose and it's got rather sore. Now, the weird thing is it's another bit of a hit and a run toxin that up to five minutes exposure. So you turn your horse out in the morning. There's flowering buttercups there. It's damp and there's the dew in the rain that causes irritation with the pollen on the nose. But the actual signs don't appear for two or three days later. So it isn't always that easy to make the connection between cause and effect. But swollen faces, sores on the mouth. Uh, and a bit of dribbling is buttercups. Now, the other thing is nettle rashes. Uh, we all know this is a nettle rash. This is another reaction of a horse who's munched on nettles. And uh, it's, it is quite a common poisonous plant problem for us, vet, us as vets in practice. People will turn their usually a thin skin thoroughbred out uh, without a rug on. They go and roll in nettles because they don't know that nettles are going to sting. You think they might realise, but they don't. Okay. And then they will get extremely uncomfortable because you can imagine we know what it's like when we touch a single nettle. If you roll in them, uh, there's going to be a horrible, painful, stinging feeling. And the horse will tend to turn away from the side where it, it's rolled. They will throw themselves on the ground or collapse and we get called thinking people think they're having a fit or something like that or bad colic and it will be a nettle rash the clue is the big squash pile of nettles in the corner of the field it happens pretty instantly and people need to be really careful when they're dealing with these horses because they can be hard to handle they're pretty unhappy as you would be if you ruled in nettles in the nude not recommended so uh I just wanted to go through 
the fact that the ordinary things that are poisonous are in hedgerows. And these, you know, if a horse is in the field, that field's probably been grazed for years and unlikely to have poisonous plants in because it's been there, they've been there for a long time. But we do see issues, particularly with the paddock pets, hence this picture. You'd think that the barbed wire is the hazard here, but in reality, if someone's made part of their garden into a donkey paddock or whatever, things like hedgerows, yew, laurel, rhododendrons, all those things are poisonous. Or what is unfortunately also seen when people cut the garden plants or the grass and throw it into the paddock with pretty nasty effects for the creatures therein. I might be stretching a point when I added mouldy hay as a poison, but it is pretty bad for the horses. It will cause awful respiratory diseases, particularly as we all know, coughing, nasal discharge, and a reluctance to work. And it is probably one of the more common things which affects horses' health coming from plants. Uh, I wanted to go through, these are the two really serious, acutely poisonous plants, allegedly, a horse only needs night needs to eat a mouthful of you and it will succumb all i can say is that the same gray horse which is fixtured in two of the pictures i was out hacking one day in that peaceful relaxing after work mode and we were going through the woods he reached out and managed to grab of all things a mouthful of you and i sort of woke up from my relaxation immediately, leapt off and was gobbling around, pulling out of his mouth. And he was absolutely fine. But I think my the rest of that ride, I was just waiting for him to keel over and he must have got some of the you, but I got it out of his mouth. So it is very poisonous, but, and for that reason, it's normally grown in churchyards and things because yew trees apparently last, will grow for hundreds of years and what would be really dangerous is the donkeys in the po in the homemade paddock in the garden in the old rectory, which is next to the churchyard with a yew tree there. So you want never be wary grazing next to churchyards uh, and there should be a boundary fence. Uh, avoid you at all costs. Um, now, water dropwort, dropwort always seems to be the one nobody knows about. And in all the years I've been a vet, I've seen two cases, both in the, it grows in ditchy areas and in the Weald of Kent, there's a particular area where we get this, uh, and also places like the Somerset Levels. And it has these roots which exposed and are known as dead man's fingers. They look a little bit like parsnips. And if you really want an interesting Google, you look up uh, apparently some people went foraging and picked these and ate them as a parsnip stew in somewhere in rural Scotland. They then all got ill and there was it was a challenge for the local hospital working out what had happened. Unfortunately, one of them hadn't eaten the stew, was able to take the local police to the site of where they picked the plants and they identified it with the aid of a botanist. Uh, but with horses, it's someone's gone along, dug the ditch out. These things are lying there. And apparently these roots are relatively pal palatable. They're a bit like carrots, parsnips, and are extremely poisonous. So beware of any ditching in air issues in your grazing areas. Uh, I just wanted to highlight when any poisoning or any problems, you need to, if you know your horse, if you're able to monitor their vital signs, it means that you're going to spot a problem early and it's more likely to be managed successfully. So you want to be able to know their breathing, be able to know, are they panting? Are they breathing normally? And ensure that the horses don't go hungry so they're not tempted to eat the wrong thing. And this is sort of counter 
intuitive than a normal veterinary advice of not to let your horse get too fat. But they do want, especially when they're turned out, they need to have something to graze. They need to be able to, they are designed to nibble and graze all the time, constant grazers. So there's got to be something for them to eat. If they can't, there isn't grass, if there isn't hay, they'll start exploring things and eat something they shouldn't. So, but it is probably obvious to say that the first thing you should do if you suspect your horse has eaten a poisonous plant is prevent further exposure, contact your vent, uh, your vet, and consider collecting samples. The going back to the water drop work, it was a fascinating read of the problem where they had people poisoned with this, how long it took them to actually, because they were told that they'd had a wild parsnip stew and you know, you need to, it helps if you have an idea what's going on and what they've eaten. So just talking about treatment options for horses who have been poisoned, in all honesty, they are depressingly limited. I'm quite okay on putting creams on skin lesions for buttercups, but once a horse has eaten the poison, horses can't vomit, unlike people. So if we know that the horse has recently eaten a toxic substance. We had an issue, for instance, recently where someone's horse ate rat poison and we were using a combination of intestinal absorbents and lavage, you know, washing out the stomach contents with lots of water and a stomach tube and using things to mop up the poison like psyllium husks or activated charcoal just to prevent the body absorbing it. Uh, and once the toxic effects, it has been absorbed, it can be incredibly difficult. It's very, it's very unlikely that there's going to be a specific anecdote, anti, an, antidote, isn't it? Yes, not anecdote, antidote for a poison. Uh, so we're basically treating the cases symptomatically to relieve the signs and manage the toxic effects where possible. And many of these horses need to be hospitalized for the best chance of recovery so they can receive intravenous fluids. You can see this horse is actually on intravenous saline. I don't know how many of you are used to seeing horses on drips, but that is a five litre bag of fluids where if you were I in hospital, you'd have a maximum of a litre. So, and we will be pushing in between 40 and 80 of those litres a day. We will sometimes use pumps. And this is also hyperimmune plasma. So we're giving the horse plasma to boost proteins at the same time, trying to tempt it to eat there. So I do feel that lush grass is a plant poison and grass can cause harm as i keep on saying if there's not enough grass for a horse to eat they will eat other things that it should ideally avoid if there's too much they can overeat and if they eat grass cuttings and other rotting plant deb debris it is fairly catastrophic and obviously best avoided equally i just put this in as a case of lam acute laminitis here, and here's an x-ray of a laminitic with a clog on place, hence all the screws. And, you know, laminitis, we see horses get laminitis the way people get headaches. And we see it as a complication when they are have sustained a serious incident of some kind of toxin or poisoning, but or they've eaten some even a small amount of some wrong things they shouldn't but most of all we see it as a consequence of overfeeding particularly lush grass uh, and just to finish off I've taken a bit of a cheats option here in that I've copied this the world horse welfare's poisonous plants leaflet because that gives you all the multiple plants not all of which I've had time to talk about tonight I've tried to stick to the major and more serious, more common issues, but there are others out there. But think ragwort, think all yellow plants, think sycamores, and you won't be far wrong from avoiding problems. So on 25 minutes and a bit, 
I just want to say thank you to the my colleagues at Bell and to World All's Horse Welfare for the, all their help and for inviting me to deliver this presentation. And there we are. I'll stop sharing my screen. Karen, thank you so much. Well, the, lots to get into there. Um, the one thing I noticed there was the sort of the, the slight um, sort of challenges that horse owners face because, you know, we want to avoid trees or avoid some trees, but avoid cutting trees down. We want to allow horses to eat enough, but they're not. To, <laughs> eat to, so Sorry. It, no, no, no. It, it, I mean, it, it shows it's not a simple sort of solution, isn't it? And, and I think the practical advice you've given and we can it, it, unpick that a bit more during the it, it, during the uh, questions. I think it's absolutely brilliant. So thank you very much. I do have to ask you, though, Karen, what were you doing with the panda? Um, maybe one shouldn't be explaining because it's before the nine o'clock watershed. <laughs> <laughs> but let's just say that pandas are bred by artificial insemination. I got you. Got you. I, I'm, yeah, we're, we're, we're good. Um, excellent. <laughs> um, moving swiftly on. Um, I, I did ask the question. Um, yes. So now what we're going to do is <laughs> go into a structured Q&A. And I'm delighted, as I mentioned at the beginning, that we've got Chris Shaw, uh, one of the 17 World Horse Welfare field officers, joining us this evening. Um, and I'm going to just little, see if I can get that from the, from the current slide. Hopefully you can see that. And and Chris has been with us now for, for six years, having been with the RSPCA beforehand and where he was also an equine officer. Uh, sorry, he's been with us for over eight years. Um, and actually so, something that's additionally brilliant with Chris is the fact that he is also uh, a, a suitably qualified person around the issue of um, uh, prescribing wormers. And as we've talked previously on World Horse Welfare webinars, the fact that the challenge of worming resistance um, and antimic resistance is such an important one. So he's, he's hugely experienced, Chris, which is, which is brilliant to, to have him with us. Now, um, I, I could, obviously, I know Chris quite well, so there's all sorts of quirky facts I could give. Uh, but I, I do actually love this one, which he volunteered himself. He says he loves plants. But when he says he loves plants, he really loves plants because he has two allotments and was uh, shocked. Fun. He has 70. He obviously had a bit of time uh, one day and counted that at home. He has 79 house plants. And he's also cycled from John O'Groats to Land's End in two weeks, raising over a thousand pounds for charity. So there you go. Um, you've got our um, extraordinary uh, panel of Karen and Chris. Um, and um, Chris, I I'll come to you first. Uh, and, and just say welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Well, hi there, Tim Harvey. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, and obviously, you, you're called out to, to welfare calls the whole time through World Horse Welfare and your job as a field officer. What would you say is the most common plant related call you, you've experienced both during your time at the RSPCA and at World Horse Welfare? 100% it would be ragwort. Like we, uh, yeah, we get a lot of calls to sort of ragwort fields and uh you know sort of have to go and sort of gauge how bad the field is and as Karen was sort of saying earlier you know you have to sort of look at the field as a whole and and sort of consider what they've got to eat in there if there's nothing to eat and the only thing that they've got is ragwort then you've obviously got a problem so you know but yeah definitely uh, the most common uh, one we get called to is is ragwort and do, do, just as a supplementary to that Chris is it it, Karen said there's obviously more there's there's more talk about it it is promoted heavily um it, is it the problem getting worse is it getting better is it as bad as it's ever been I think it's view? uh it's it's you know sort of probably is getting worse because you know that the plant is quite quite good at dispersing its seeds and you know you've only got to have a field full of ragwort nearby and those seeds will blow in and you, you you're constantly fighting it basically you know you've got to get get to the roots pull the plant up you know ideally get rid of the plant before it goes to flower and to seed uh, and there's sort of guidelines about how you've got to dispose of that you know ideally if you can bag it up and the best sort of way to to dispose of it is to actually burn it you know but you've obviously got to do that safely so um so yeah but it's I would say, you know, we, we uh, sort of see it more and I do feel for the owners that really do maintain their, their land 
and you know they may have someone nearby who isn't quite as good and those seeds will just keep blowing in and you know i did a bit of research about um sort of ragwort and you know it's quite incredible but one plant can produce about uh 2000 to 2500 flowers that's just one plant and each plant can produce up to 75 to 120,000 seeds and they get dispersed by the wind. So, you know, it's it's a really well spread plant. And, uh, you know, it's that the, the, there are some benefits to ragwort, but certainly not for, for horses, but, you know, for other insects and things. So, but, you know, the, the general rule of thumb is you don't want it any, anywhere near any of your horses, really, you know, and if yeah. you can get in those fields and pull it before it goes to flower and seed, that, that, that's brilliant. And it does amaze me. I mean, you can pull it every year and yeah, it still comes back and it's, 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 it's hard work. Um, Karen, if people, you've sort of touched on this, but I just think it's such an important aspect um, for people to, to, to know. But if people suspect that their horse is suffering from a, a toxin or a poison, what should they do? Um, I mean, the obvious answer, I would say, wouldn't I, is contact your vet. Uh, but I think that's really, really true. And interestingly enough, it's very, very common when we're faced with a horse with an unknown illness, people always think they're poisoned. And 95% of the time, it isn't a poison. But I guess, don't panic, don't procrastinate, get help straight away. Don't always think the worst either. And you were saying, I mean, some of the signs are quite acute, you know, mm -hmm. sort of horrible mm -hmm. diarrhea, a horse that's, you know, clearly in pain, that, that's recumbent. But is it sometimes that some of the signs are a bit more subtle? Yeah, and that's one of the things where ragwort is such a beast. Uh, and that's why I described it as a hit and run poison. It does its damage. You don't know about it. The liver is an incredibly strong organ you can live on a third of your liver uh as you know people with liver disease are uh, are it takes a long time before a human needs a liver transplant uh so horses will have incredibly diseased livers if we do an ultrasound scan for instance on a suspect ragwort case the liver you put the scanner on and i fall for this every time i put the scanner on where you know the liver is and you can't see it because it's gone tiny and shrunken and it's just not there so you know a horse which is looking a bit poor i mean think of the color of the horse i showed the picture of with the scabby skin uh it's i mean that's obvious is fairly obvious but just a poor coat weight loss not looking well best to get them checked and that was my point of trying to say know your horse is well so you know when they're not well yeah absolutely know know what's normal that's a that's yeah. a really really good point um i thought everyone was being quite quiet out there but suddenly you've you've hit the turbo charge and we've got lots of questions coming in which is absolutely brilliant do remember if you're on zoom and you see a question you like just upvote it because i'll always try and get to the questions that are voted most so do do put in a question that, that that is of interest to you but if you already see it there then please do upvote it um and it's lovely to see people um from lots of around from Sussex. I, I notice no one's declaring them from Kent or uh, 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 where people are from, Karen. I, I don't know. That, that's <laughs> so, so you know, But we've got, it's great to see people across Europe and Switzerland and indeed across the other side of the, of the pond as well in, in the US. So a, a very warm welcome to, to you all. And thank you for joining us and thank you for your questions. Um, Chris, another question for you. Uh, what strategies can people use to minimise the risk of poisonous plants in their fields? I think the main thing is to be aware of them and you know you've got to deal with each of them dif differently you know the, the the sort of big ones we need to be aware of is like your ragwort your acorns your sycamores things like that so you know and you need to sort of manage those all differently as we've mentioned before with ragwort you've got to pull it and dispose of it you know get rid of it out of the field with with acorns you know if you've got a big tree in your paddock um, you know, at the time of year when the acorns are sort of dropping, if you can either put some electric fencing around that tree and just sort of create a bit of a barrier, 
and then maybe get a rake and just go out there, you know, once a week or a bit more regular and rake those acorns up and just move them somewhere else. With the sycamores, I mean, um, you know, I'm noticing all the saplings coming up at the moment that, you know, we've sort of, when I was doing the poop picking at the weekend, I, I noticed them also. I sort of spent a bit of time just going around the field, pulling out the sycamore saplings. Um, you know, and if you sort of see those blowing into your fields, they are really hard to get rid of, you know, the, the like little, little helicopters, as we call them, um, you know, but if you sort of, you know, can can get the trees tested, because as Karen was sort of saying earlier, they're all different, the trees and some have different levels of toxicity and that changes from year to year, depending on the UV and the rainfall that we've had that year. So, you know, it's it's sort of just being aware of these things. Um, you know, and, and just, you know, if, if you've got hedgerows in your fields, you know, just be aware of the plants that could be in there and that could cause problems, you know, and also like if, um, you know, like with use and things like that, if you've got neighbours that have got those trees, just, you know, if you if you get on well with them, if you can just have a word with them and say, look, you know, I've got horses in my field, please don't ever put anything over there or anything like that. So, so yeah, but I think the main thing owners can do with the horses is to just do some research on the plants and just check what they've got grown around their fields, really. Brilliant. Thank you. you. Chris, you mentioned it, and Karen, you also mentioned it earlier, about testing trees. If I'm an owner, um, how, how would I go about testing a tree? I think uh, it will appear on the links on the list, uh, but there is the Royal Veterinary College uh, have a very good active research group doing work on this. And you basically ask your own vet or look on the line online for the Royal Veterinary College. Here we are. The links magically popped up and it tells you exactly what to do. Uh, and it's Brilliant. quite surprising. It's a little bit like worming horses where... Um, 80% of the worms are in 20% of the horses. You'll find it's the same with sycamore toxins. Yes, got you. And it's a bit of sport we always play. If you want to mention links, either of you, then do. And we sort of, I always time Basil to see how long it takes him to get him up there. <laughs> to be honest, he's too good for me. Um, Karen, um, you've, you, again, you've covered this, but I think it's so worth reiterating. If if you had to, if people had to go away today from saying that they should know how to recognise the three most poisonous plants or the top three poisonous plants, um, what would they be? Ragwort, number one, sycamore, number two, and acorns, who are a long, a slow third. OK, so very much sycamore and, and, and ragwort. Sort of, yeah. Uh, yeah. OK, fine. Brilliant. Um, and as Beth's got an qu interesting question around acorns, but I'll wait for that. Um, then, Chris, coming to you, and I'll probably ask this to, Car uh, to Karen as well. But what's the most obscure poisoning or plant related case you, you, you have come across in your time? I mean, this is a tough one because I've seen a few and, uh, you know, the, the, the two, I've been sort of battling about which one to sort of bring up. But I, I think, what you know, well, I'm going to go for the yew tree one because, um, you know, I got called out to um, a, a, a report with about a couple of horses that I'd dealt with in the past. And when I actually arrived at the field, unfortunately, the two horses were actually dead in the field and I knew the owner. So I called him out straight away and he came and met me there. Uh, we had a quick look around the fields because the horses were appeared to be fit and well, apart from obviously that they, they were dead. But they, um, you know, and as we were looking around, we just found a load of yew tree cuttings. And then basically one of the neighbours had, had obviously chopped, chopped some of the branches off their own tree and then thrown them over the fence into the horses field. The owner was absolutely, as you can imagine, devastated. And, and he sort of asked me to go and have a word with the neighbours and just sort of to tell them never to do that again. And... I'll always remember their reaction because they were all equally devastated. You know, they had no idea what they were doing. You know, they just, you know, trimmed a tree and they just took some tree cuttings over the fence. So they thought, but, you know, it was, um, but yeah. So, I mean, um, you know, but yeah, uh, I, I have got another one, but it, it depends whether we've got time at all. Well, let's see. We've got so many uh, questions coming in, but let's see. Um, but uh, I think there's a common theme there, isn't it, about grass cuttings and cuttings, of, you know, pulling up ragwort and leaving it where it's accessible. You know, just, it's even worse uh, almost than, than, than the original plant itself. Um, so, and, and Karen, what's, what's the most obscure one you've come across? Uh, nicotine poisoning. Uh, oh, yeah. Children or young teenagers 
at um, horsey camps or similar and they've stashed their illegal cigarettes in the hay store or in the hay net or in a bucket in the horse gets hold of their pack of 20 or I guess they might even have packs of 200 <laughs> and you see these it's really frightening if your horse eats a pack of cigarettes they're twitching they're dribbling they are hyper excited and of course no one's going to admit that their cigarettes are missing and the first time this happened I was really quite worried because you're at a horse show somewhere and a horse showing obscure signs so nicotine poisoning so that's an easy answer don't let I mean, how they can think stashing cigarettes in a hay net is a good idea but it happens uh uh, and I don't want to go off topic, but I similarly once when I used to do cats and dogs was presented with a dog who was in an excitable state and the person brought the dog into evening surgery and said it had eaten its eaten their pot plant. And it took me a while to work out what they meant by their pot plant, emphasis <laughs> on the pot. So those are my obscure ones. And once I had a case of this water dropwort poisoning, which is why I emphasized it where we literally had a dead horse with those sort of dead man's fingers parsnip things in its mouth so really unpleasant right. yeah, yeah but nicotine and water drop word. okay brilliant and I just noticed Sue's put in the chat that the RBC testing costs 132 pounds per sample so it's not cheap so it's not something you want to do routinely but certainly if it's it's something that causes you concern then it, that that option is there and obviously you know that's a relative cost to, to having a vet, vet call out on, and everything then um it will be money very well spent um brilliant now we've got lots of questions so um chris and karen if you can keep the answers as tight as possible we'll see how many we can get through sue's asked that the, the excellent question which chris is coming to you i thought there used to be a requirement on local authorities to clear ragwort on public land and highways as an invasive plant is this still the case there is some legislation around uh, ragwort and i think it's with natural england but it doesn't, as far as I know, it doesn't specify that it's for livestock. I think it's more for agricultural ground. Uh, so, you know, and as far as I know, I did try and do some research on that today, see if there's actually been any successful prosecutions around that, and I couldn't find anything. No, I've never, people often ask me about this, and I'm utterly unaware of any successful prosecutions on on it and you know we all know the way we see it on road verges and the like and it seems to be horribly ubiquitous yeah yeah do you know where, where did i should know myself well where did ragwort come from is it or is it is it native to this or is it an alien species to to the uk i i have the um, i've been told uh, that uh i don't know whether this is true but that back in a long long time ago when the tea merchants used to travel around the uk bringing the tea from other countries apparently that's where the ragwort came from okay it's so it's been of... around a long long time yeah, yeah. Right. and um, such an effective yeah. spreading plant the way it grows and spreads awful yeah those numbers that crisp <laughs> you blimey me hundred thousand a plant um beth has asked karen is it we talked about acorns and obviously the acorn itself but is it the leaves of the uh, of the tree that are poisonous as well um the tannins which is the toxic principle in the oak are much much more concentrated in the acorns so you would have to eat an awful lot of leaves which i don't think the majority of horses would do going back to my point is give them something else to eat and they won't but high volumes of acorns and the more they eat the worse it is right so if you're removing the acorns themselves then you're yeah. removing the majority of the risk yes. okay got got you brilliant um agnieszka's asked and i don't know whether who, who's but best answer this are cow parsley and water drop work the same plants they're similar but water drop drop word is a uh, it's the nasty big bro brother thuggy big brother the thuggy big brother okay um i think possibly for the for, for uh, but cow parsley possibly. isn't poisonous right fine okay in, the, in that anywhere near to that degree she... okay yeah yeah fine 
Okay, got you. Um, again, b- both of you probably have a view on this, but Chris, I'll come to you first. Do you think climate change is causing different plants to cause problems for horses than seen, let's say, at the turn of the century? Well, that's a tough one, Roly. I mean, uh, you know, I, I think um, obviously the, the, the studies out are saying that the planet's getting warmer. Uh, I know more non, non-invasive, well, sorry, non-native species are coming into the country. Um, so, 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 yeah, but I'd, I wouldn't be able to confidently answer that, if I'm honest. Yeah. No, um, d- obviously d- there's a lot known about the different type of uh, insects that are, are coming on to, into the country as a result directly, um, including the, uh, the, the um, what uh, transmits African horse sickness. Garen, from a, from a poisonous plant perspective, are you aware of any changes? I do wonder why, if that's one of the reasons that sycamore poisoning has become more of an issue, yeah. uh, because we see an awful lot more of it and whether it's something to do with hot dry summers the trees accumulate toxins again doing my homework beforehand i looked this up uh and there isn't we don't have any clear evidence but one has to wonder why there is an increase in cases yeah absolutely um yeah uh, and you know this it, it, it's, it's logical to think that there is there must be some mm. connection yeah um now, Chris, I think you mentioned this earlier about the environmental aspects, uh, specifically of rag work, and, and, and Talia has asked it. What is your response to owners or people, not necessarily just owners, who assert that rag work should be left for the cinnabar moth? Uh, I, 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 you know, I think if there's no horses nearby, then there is an argument for that. Uh, but, you know, if I, like I said earlier, I think, you know, when it comes to horses and cattle, you want to keep them well away from the ragwort. You know, as Karen's been saying, it, it sort of has an accumulative effect. I know it mainly affects sort of, you know, younger horses as well. Um, you know, so I think, you know, yeah, the, the, I mean, when I was doing some of the research in sort of ragwort, there is some study saying that, you know, it does feed a lot of insects and, you know, the the sort of the cinnabar moth, you know, that really does sort of rely on the, the ragwort. So, you know, I think some plants should be, but, you know, they, like say, they should definitely be kept well away from your horses. And, you know, and the problem is, is, is how it seeds and how it spreads its seeds, you know, it's, it's, and it's so easy. I mean, those little crowns you get in the grounds, you know, they're, they're, you know, and, and the roots, they're just, you know, they're just so effective of what they do. You can think you've got it all, but you've only got to leave a little bit of the root and it's it's coming back up again, yeah. you know. So, yeah, I'd, I'd sort of say um, it's, it's, yeah, definitely should just be kept away from cattle and horses. Speaking as the one who has to pick up the pieces when there are horse poisoning incidents, I'm afraid my priority has got to be the horses over the cinnabar moths and there is so many ragwort plants out there that i'm sure the cinnabar moths can trot along away from horsey paddocks yes absolutely the image of a cinnabar moth trotting along now is 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 one i'm going to have difficult to get out of my mind um that that that's great thank you very much for that um question on facebook carol's asked um are acorns poisonous after they go brown karen they are that's a good question and i my understanding is they're worse when they're fresh and green and people when coffee beans weren't available during the war people used to make ersatz coffee from acorns which they roasted so and so the short answer is the green ones are worse than the brown ones but if you ate enough brown ones it wouldn't be great right Okay, got it's you. quantity. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, so avoid, but the, the, the green ones would be worse. Um, so, um, Kristen's asked now, Chris. I don't know if you, you you're aware of this, but there there is that this don't eat that training for dogs, um, um, and which I'm aware of, especially for Labradors. Um, but do you know of any don't eat that training for horses? 
No, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, it'd be a good idea. I, I, I'm hoping that in the colleges and things, they teach the sort of equine students, you know, about these things and obviously to teach the vets. But I, um, yeah, I think uh, as regards to sort of workshops yeah. for equine owners, I don't think there are, but, you know, World Horse Welfare, we, we have a very handy little uh, uh, sort of fold out leaflet with all the, the sort of key plants on there that you need to watch out for. So, you know, and if anyone wants those, you know, either come to World Horse Welfare website or contact us and, you know, we'll get those out to you. Yeah, brilliant. Karen highlighted that uh, at the end of her talk, didn't she? Which is, uh, and Karen, you mentioned it, the fact that, you know, you can have a horse, like the picture of your horse on holiday, um, when you were on holiday, not the horse, yeah. um, but it can be in the middle of uh, uh, masses of ragwort and it won't be eating it. And then when there's literally nothing to eat, it will eat it. So exactly. it's, not as if, it's not as if they're like Labradors and go straight in and start chomping away at it, is there? No, they're, they are fastidious and they will prefer to eat the quality food rather than the ragwort um unlike the labrador i had for poisoning where it ate the slow the slows which had been tipped out of the slow gin and ended up yeah. as a poison drunk labrador no well yeah poor labrador um but being the owner of a labrador i can well imagine how that happened um uh, the hobbs family i'm not sure if it's come from the whole family or from one member of the Ho hobbs family but karen probably with the water drop wort, is it only the root that is poisonous or the leaves and flowers as well the whole thing's nasty right avoid as a lot the root the root the poison accumulates in the roots and i did read something that they eat the leaves they taste a bit nice nice so then they eat a bit more and then they take the root avoid yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Chris, question on Facebook, um, and I can well sympathise, Who there's no name, but how can we help protect our horses from ragwort poisoning when next door's fields are full of it and they don't act upon it? I think, you know, yeah, unfortunately, I do meet owners in this sort of situation. And I think the best thing you can do if you're in that situation yourself is is just to keep your fields clear, you know, and, and sort of maybe put some barrier fence in extra onto the sort of the perimeter fence and to prevent your horses from sort of reaching over and grazing it but if you've got a good paddock and you're feeding your horse as well you know chances are if there is ragwort next door they they hopefully won't touch it but you know if 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 i was in that situation i probably would just put up some extra electric fencing just to prevent them getting anywhere near it and just be hyper vigilant when it comes to sort of pulling up the crowns and the the plants in your own fields and you know um you, yeah it's it's a real tricky one and and yeah that that but you know you've got to try and just do your best haven't you really yeah and karen any any tips from you and your experience of how to try and engage owners to who, who are not pulling their rag work um i wish that i did in yeah. but i think you guys have been so good at providing education that people know and if they can and they've got the time they will yeah i did once buy someone a ragwort routing device as a bribe oh, okay yeah yeah yes yeah, so that's a possibility um all right brilliant um and then staying on the ragwort theme i mean chris just on that i mean we, when you talk about pulling it um wh what are you recommending that people uh, obviously remove it and ideally burn it but you're pulling it up with gloves yeah. yeah definitely it's quite poisonous to us as well and you know it, it, it yeah you want to make sure you've got gloves on when you're handling it because you know it, it's it's not good for humans either so um so yeah i mean and as karen mentioned you can get a special fork to sort of get those out of the ground because you know and if you try and do it like after rainfall when the ground's a bit softer you'll get more of the roots out and it's more effective that way so um so yeah it's um yeah I mean, it is amazing, the root patterns of a ragwort plant, isn't it? I mean, it's just yeah. extraordinary. Um, Karen, apart from pulling ragwort, what other paddock management can I do to help prevent the spread of poisonous plants? That good question. I'm very lazy with these, and I refer it to our local agricultural contractors with the right who amaze me with their appropriate chemicals which will reduce buttercups ragwort what have you and the key thing is that avoiding using the paddocks after they've been sprayed but 
I think you need a good agricultural contractor and paddock managing person who who will help you. And it all I know it all costs money. Uh, but it's better that than po poisoned horses. Yeah, and it's, it's obviously short term pain for long term gain. Yeah. Isn't it? Um, Chris, any other thoughts on that? About yeah, no, well, I, you know, I, 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 yeah, I think the if you are to get the people out to spray it, like Karen said, make sure you get the experts and follow their yeah. advice, you know, and just um, make sure you, you you keep your horses off the paddock. Some sometimes it can be a week or two weeks, you know, so. It's whether you want to go down that route or whether you actually just want to get in the fields and, you know, physically pull the plant yeah. out because, you know, that's much safer for the horse. Yeah. Yes. There's obviously the cost, but there's also the environmental impact of, of using um, sort of treatments as well as there. So um, absolutely. Uh, Karen, um, Anne's asked, Anne Silver, how poisonous is ivy? My pony loves to grab a mouthful occasionally. I think the odd mouthful occasionally isn't a problem and it is a quite sort of astringent slightly purgative purgative thing so and it was at one stage used as a purgative as an old-fashioned wormer people used to chop and make soups of uh nettles and ivy to encourage the horses to pass lots of droppings and get rid of the worms a small amount is okay but i wouldn't start feeding it on a regular basis Brilliant. Moderation uh, in all things. Absolutely. Um, question on mini Shetland. So I'm going to have to come to you, Chris. But firstly, uh, Chris, I've noticed a bridle. Work. You've got a bridle on the back of your door there. It looks very clean. Is that a special? <laughs> did, you, did, you, did you clean it especially for, for the webinar today? Well, no, I didn't. But yeah, one of them's clean. One's not clean. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, Claire has asked, I have an issue of my mini Shetland eating conkers, which has caused colic and a large bill. Are these poisonous too, or just a, a, a cause of intestinal irritation? Oh well, I, I you know I wouldn't sort of be encouraging horses to eat conkers, <laughs> you know. So um, yeah, uh, but I think that that might be more of a Karen Karen answer. Yeah, uh, I like that passing. Yes, uh, I'll try and ping it back, but I can't. <laughs> uh, moder again, I go back to the moderation in all things. Uh, I don't actually think there's much poisonous in conkers but they're not a foodstuff yeah so best avoid and in a mini shetland all you need is a mini shetland who doesn't chew properly which they often don't because their teeth aren't always as good as they should be and then you'll get an obstruction from conkers in their intestines so yeah. uh just don't do it just don't do it the mini shetland's probably the equine equivalent of the labrador is it yeah, i would it? suspect so um karen a question um why do you think why do you think that atypical myopathy seems to be a new disease i think there's been a lot of research on it but in all the years that i've been a vet i've seen cases of it and there's particular areas and one of my theories which is yet to be proven that it's related to pollution because we see a lot in areas next to big busy roads but you could also argue that that might not be the best grazing either yeah. uh i think it's always it was ever thus it's always been there but there's been some fantastic research from london vet school uh the university of liege in Belgium and we've it's only been in the last 10 years that we've worked out that the toxin was coming from sycamores and identified what that toxin is so it's just modern research now we know more about it yes brilliant um Chris Sue has asked and I, th I guess the answer to this is probably refer it to to to, to, to local agriculturist but is there a specific weed killer that is effective on sycamore seedlings Oh, I, I, yeah, I wouldn't know yeah. that one. I'm not, it's, not, not big it, up on that. It's really, really hard, I believe, because I've I've had this issue uh, with, and apparently mowing or strimming is works better than a weed killer because there's that early sprouts, they're difficult to, ca to get. There yeah. will be something, but it's that balance between spraying chemicals around and if you just mowed that area off you'd get rid of them as well yeah brilliant okay question uh for you chris how important is it to remove bracken from paddocks 
I'd say it's pretty important. I mean, once again, Bracken spreads, you know, quite quickly. Uh, and it's, you know, it's not good for the horses at all. You know, it's quite poisonous to them. So if, yeah, I wouldn't, wouldn't, you know, be wanting my horses to be anywhere near sort of Bracken, you know, um, yeah. yeah. When I when I was a child, we used to um, use bracken as bedding in the Lake District. Uh, and, you know, dried bracken as bedding is a really bad idea, but it yeah. used to be used and it, I would think is much less commonly so. Let's I think it's so. quite bad for humans as well, isn't it? Yes, and it can it can cause and it's very bad for cattle. It causes bladder cancers and things like that. So it goes but it goes back to the same thing if they've got something nice to eat they won't eat it yeah that's a, certainly a common thing and the it. fell pony who's used to having bracken all around it will eat the grass not the bracken but you put your introducer horse to it and they go oh what's that and they start eating it yeah so somewhere some training has happened or maybe evolution has selected fell yeah. ponies yeah. who don't eat bracken Yes, a Darwinian theory. Mm. Um, Karen, um, on Facebook, can you test a horse to see if its liver has been damaged by ragwort before the horse becomes ill? Not that accurately, because it the damage within the liver is patchy. Uh, you could get some idea by doing blood tests. Yeah. But, Go, you, you could mes measure doing blood tests to measure liver function would give you some information but as i said the liver is such a powerfully efficient organ that providing one third of it is still working you might not get definitive information brilliant a um, couple of questions for you karen here i think well and chris do chime in how would uh, Karen's asked on Facebook? How would we know that there, if there was a regional outbreak? Outbreak of of a of, typical myopathy yes. or whatever. Well, I'm assuming so. I well, I suggest I suspect it would be the power of social media. Certainly, when we see a lot of cases, we would put it on the hospitals. Uh, Instagram and Facebook and what have you and. Yeah. Whenever we do, those posts get widely, widely shared. But I think you kind of need to assume that if the grazing is sparse, if you have windstorms and you've got sycamore helicopters around about the place, you can, ha you will have a potential problem. You might have a horse which either has got a tough liver, doesn't eat sycamore, or will manage, but. I think you've got to assume the problem is always there. Yeah. And the thing about you saying about a tough liver, it's, it's probably not a tough liver. It's just it's coping and then it copes until it doesn't cope. Exactly. Yeah, and then you've got problems. Um, and Anna's asked, does all the information given tonight apply to donkeys as well? I would say yes, but donkeys are so incredibly tough and stoical. I mean, if you saw that picture I had of the donkey in Jordan, it was doing very nicely on absolutely next to nothing to eat. They are tougher creatures than most, the majority of horses, but they're so stoical that they, they certainly wouldn't tell you till their liver's on its last legs. No, uh, yes, absolutely. It's, it's certainly one for, for, for the donkey sanctuary as well. If if you do have donkeys, do check with them. Mm -hmm. um, Chris, um, Louise has asked, what's the best way to stop buttercups coming back? Spraying? Yeah, I think it, it, it is. And it's judicious spraying at the right time. Okay. But again, seeking, seeking advice on yeah. that. Um, Chris, um, Sophie's asked, are daffodils poisonous? Uh, apparently the bulbs are very poison are poisonous to people and every year there are toxicities where people mix up uh onions and uh onions and uh, uh, bulbs flower bulbs i don't actually know about the flowers but they do fall into my yellow flowers aren't great rule yes. i suspect I will have to have a quick Google because I don't actually know about that. I've never encountered. This is always a dangerous in statement when I say I've never seen a case of daffodil poisoning. I might have seen one, but I didn't realise, you know. 
it's I was going to ask you about cause and effect um yes about... exactly yeah. Yeah. Um, but go on we, I have had having said that I have had ponies eat flower bouquets with no ill effects okay oh interesting um Chris any thoughts on daffodils yeah, I'm not 100% sure on those. Um, I know they don't smell very great, so I don't know if that puts the, the, the horses off. So, uh, so yeah. yeah, but I'm not, not 100% sure, I'm afraid, Tony, at Rowley. And Bethan's asked, Chris, how toxic are cherry trees? If we have one in the paddock, do we just stop grazing when it's losing leaves? Oh, cherry tree. Uh, that's another new one on me. I mean, uh, yeah, I'd, 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 I'd probably be wanting to be fencing that off anyway, because if the, the, the horse is going to eat too many cherries with all those stones and all that sugar, then, you know, yeah, I would, uh, would sort yeah, of be discouraging that. Other reasons, yeah. yeah. Uh, Karen, any, any thoughts on cherry trees? If that cherry tree has been in that field with horses for many years and no one's had a problem, I wouldn't be unduly worried. Having said that, uh, Prevention's better than cure. Yeah, brilliant. Um, now, Nikki's asked this question, is equine obesity the issue? Horses are generally fatter and often grazed on bare fields. Maybe that is a major contributing factor. Do you know that's a really interesting point? Uh, and I think she may well be right. If a horse doesn't get much to eat, it's going to be wandering around looking for things. So I think our obese ponies and horses need to be so carefully managed so they don't get things. They really, really don't want to be the one who's got ragwort in the field or acorns because they're the ones who I haven't got a lot of eat so a lot to eat. So oh, I'll try that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and whilst we've been talking, I've been looking up about daffodils because uh, there's some very good. The University of Minnesota and a lot of the American universities have very good websites about poisonous plants. And apparently, daffodils fall into the buttercup category. That if the horse comes in contact with the flower, it can develop skin inflammation and irritation. Brilliant. Okay, good stuff. What? What's the? Sorry, I lost my thread there. Sorry. Um, that's all right. No, not at really. Um. Chris, Louise has asked, is it true that if your horses graze in a field near a river that there can be problems for their liver? Oh, I'm not sure where the thinking is on that one. I mean, sometimes I know um, certain areas that I cover, we get regular floods. Uh, and if the field's prone to floods, you know, the, the, the flood water can bring really bad toxins onto the pasture, you know, like salmonella, compilobacter, things like that. So, uh, you know, I, I uh, but regarding sort of poisonous plants, you know, I, I'm not, I can't quite think of the thinking with that one. I know, I know there's certain plants, obviously, that will get transported around by the water networks and things. But, um, but yeah, I, I'm not, not quite sure what, what she means with that question, if I'm honest. Karen, any thoughts from you about it? Well, we suddenly see horses who get skin diseases who've been paddling in flooded paddocks. So, it's very easy for me to say avoid when if I my only field was flooded what do you do uh so but there can be all sorts of debris damaging it's more likely problems we've seen when paddocks have been flooded that dangerous items have floated in at the same time yeah. and best avoided I think the plants will probably be the least of your worries yeah good point um Chris Rachel's asked on Facebook are holly bushes poisonous yeah, I think, um, you know, it was like, you know, it kind of comes up with like... Um, the berries. Uh, yeah, the, the berries, you know, so I would sort of you'd be trying to prevent them from eating those as well. The, the, it's the same thing. If there's anything else to... You'd have to be pretty desperate to start munching holly, wouldn't you? You would have thought so. You would have thought so, unless you're a mini Shetland. Um, <laughs> or a Labrador. <laughs> or a Labrador. Um, uh, and Karen, Sue's asked, um, not poisonous, but are there benefits of cleavers or sticky weed? Sorry. Um, Sue's the... asked, if, uh, benefits of cleavers or sticky weed? I know the horses like to eat those. They're, they're the kind of like the sticky buds. Um, oh, yes. Or, yeah. I... Any benefits or just they like I them? don't. I, I don't really know, to be honest. Uh, they're certainly not poisonous. Uh, I think they're meant to be quite tasty in that they used to be used to tempt 
in one of the most difficult things is to tempt a donkey which is off off its feed because they get this condition hyperlipemia where their fat metabolism goes wrong and it's it was used to tempt donkeys to eat so it's a appetite stimulant perhaps brilliant so you guys are doing so well um we're coming <laughs> to, to coming to the end um we'll need to tie up in a minute but there's a few lots more questions coming in um D D Karen, does ragwort affect the kidneys and can it cause toxicity just through skin contact or does it have to be eaten? It it's a, the liver is uh it's the a thing called pyrazolidine alkaloid are the nasty things in ragwort and that affects the liver rather than the kidneys. I shouldn't think the kidneys are very happy about it, but it the liver is sort of the area that really, really suffers. Uh it is terribly irritant to people. This business, as Chris says, that you really, really want to wear gloves. So I suspect your thin skin thoroughbred would suffer from it, but they're not grasping it the way that we do. So I don't think it is such of such a problem. It's really primarily a liver toxin. Brilliant. Thank you. Chris, um, a question from Sophie. Do, do you know if the BHS still run their... Um uh welfare what is it their annual ragwort week possibly in april is that something you're aware of uh, i'm not not sure of that if i'm honest probably no worries so sophie i would refer contact the bhs through their website would be my suggestion there um dana has asked um i think she's asked yes there we go dana um one for you karen do you think that the yellow plant Call Tanacetum vulgare in Latin is poisonous. We have a lot of it in our pasture. Um, I will have to ask, uh, check, look that one up. But no, it isn't. It isn't high on my list. I don't. If you've got a lot in your pasture and it is proper horse grazing, where horses are grazed for a while, I would be fairly relaxed about it. Okay, brilliant. that's tansy, isn't it? So yeah, yeah not to yes. worry too much. OK, brilliant. Chris, Linda is asked on Facebook, what about bark? Are some of these dangerous? Oh, I mean, I know some horses will, will you know, eat bark if there's not much else around. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm guessing, you know, with definitely with your yew trees, pretty much the whole of the yew tree is poisonous. Yes. So, you know, uh, you wouldn't wouldn't want them chewing on a yew bark or anything like that. So and I guess. I'm not sure whether that affects with the sycamores as well, but, you know, I would kind of use the rule of thumb that if it's a poisonous seed or leaf or, you know, I'd probably keep them away from the bark as well. And some trees like willow, uh, the Latin name for willow is salix and the name for aspirin is salicate, isn't it? And there is aspirin in willow. And whenever we have issues with horses which come up positive on a, dope medication test with aspirin there's the suggestion of have they been eating willow so right. there are all sorts of things in all sorts of plants but your horse should didn't really want to be eating bark generally it's not yes. great for the teeth for the mouth and anything Brilliant. Listen, we've got through all the questions on Facebook, which haven't had any upvotes. So uh, but there's still a few to go there, but we're sort of running out of time. And I'm not sure we've ever got through so many questions. So Karen and Chris, absolutely brilliant. And Karen, you, you've done that typical female thing of multitasking, be able to go online and check on a couple of other <laughs> We're even better. Um, so I, I will ask you just to summarize, uh, well, not to summarize, just to, what we've, we've gone through a lot of questions and had a lot of discussion. What would your um, sort of final thoughts be? Um, Chris, if I come to you first, what would you, you what would your take home message or messages be uh, i guess the big one would is prevention is better than cure you know if we if you if you can sort of become aware with all these these plants that, that are poisonous and they're going to harm your horse you know and are able to look out for them and keep your horse safe i think that's the the, the key message really absolutely brilliant thank you chris and karen I think it's knowing what is in your pasture and knowing what the plants are. Like your lady who was asking about tansy, what yeah. exactly is that plant? Look at if you're in any doubt uh, and it's if it's always been there and the horses have always grazed it, well, that should be OK. But there are some of those tansies. Is that actually a form of ragwort? 
my golden rule is beware of yellow flowers. Yes, and I, that certainly resonated with me tonight. So, I mean, I, and I think let's just see if Basil's still awake. So, do the um, the uh, um, the link to the leaflet that you highlighted, Karen, on the World Horse Welfare website. You know, just shows what the main poisonous plants mm. are to, to look out for. So, so do go and have a grab at that. And as Chris says, you can also get in contact with World Horse Welfare with us, and we can send out hard copies if you if you prefer hard copy. I think so, that that beware prevention better than cure. Beware the yellow flowers. Um, I think your point, um, Karen, around um, making sure that the horses have enough to eat and don't graze down to nothing because then mm. they will look for other things like there's a a, a, a lot of uh, um a, a lot of sense in that and but i hope tonight to, or today his webinar has provided you I, I, i've learned lots uh, so i just wanted to say thank you to karen and to chris for for a really stimulating session and thank you to everyone for your um really good questions and uh, you kept that you started quiet but boy did you catch up um and uh, and surpassed uh, our ability to answer them all so i'm really sorry we couldn't answer them all but some brilliant questions there as i mentioned earlier we're drawing to a close our world horse welfare wednesday winter webinars any more w's um but we do have one additional webinar in on the 3rd of may which we, you can sign up to in the chat now for the, the webinar on strangle during Strangles Awareness Week, Awareness Week, a horrible disease, a very preventable disease, and so please do join uh, join us for that. And it just leaves me to say thank you very much to you once again for joining us. If you've enjoyed it, the webinar, which I'm sure you have, please tell your your colleagues, friends, and family about the fact that later uh, today, this webinar, along with all of our webinars, other webinars will be available on our YouTube channel. And finally, another huge thank you to Karen and Chris. I've learned a lot. I've really enjoyed it, and I've really appreciated spending uh, um, some time with you both. So, look forward to seeing you soon, and thank you very much. <laughs>